to welcome everybody to this new year. Uh, as ever, you know, we start back into the new year with the, the opening of the legislative session, which always keeps things uh, exciting. And um, uh, we took a little time off in, in December to, to try to regroup and, and uh, refocus a little bit and just kind of have some fun, you know, <laughs> enjoy those holidays. And I hope all of you did. And uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an important part of uh, just being, enjoying the, the great beauties and, and uh, uh, diversity of our county and having that time to do it. And, and sometimes uh, holidays bring out some of that, that glory. Um, Keith is ready to present uh, and I want to uh, honor his time. He is our guest today. Uh, I don't know how many of you've traveled out to uh, Snohomish, but um, I'd say the Stalker Farms are quite well known uh, among uh, those in our community. And uh, I know that uh, my kids grew up playing soccer out in Snohomish <laughs> at, the, at the Stalker Farm fields. So um, they've been an integral part of my, uh, my history as well. So um, Keith, I don't know if you wanna say a few more things about who and where you are or, uh, or just kind of plunge right in here. <laughs> well, I'll, um, I'll just go ahead and it looks like I can take over a screen share. And I'm just going to jump right into it and uh, talk a little bit. I, I, I was asked to talk about Christmas trees. And so um, I put just a little bit of a slideshow together for that. But just, you know, about us. Yeah, Stalker Farms um, is a fifth generation family farm in the Snohomish Valley. So my great grandfather settled in the late 1800s out here. Um, I have one second cousin and I who still farm in the valley, um, and both of us have our children involved in our businesses, so we, uh, we're at a fifth generation now operating. Stalker Farms itself um, has five lines of business, um, three seasons out of the year. So there was a day when, um, you know, we weren't always a, a direct marketing um, operation like we are today. Um, you know, we used to be wholesalers and raising produce for canneries and all that kind of stuff. But as times go on and the markets changed, um, we've had to change with that. And so um, today we are too small to be big and too big to be small. And so what we've identified as a, um, a viable marketing or operating niche is um, to direct market. And what that really means is everything we do now, we sell directly to our customers on the farm. So whether that's um, at our blueberry farm, uh, Mountain View Blueberries, or um, it's hosting weddings, it's doing our fall operations, or it's doing Christmas trees. Um, you know, we're everything we're doing is a direct sale and um, cutting out the middleman and not having to pay for distributors and brokers and take and be price takers. We can actually be price setters. So um, that's kind of where our business has evolved to. Um, so I'm a civil engineer um, of all things um, from WSU. When I was 18, I couldn't get off the farm fast enough. Um, I was tired of being free labor. I was actually blessed to be able to go to school and get an engineering degree. Moved to the Bay Area. My wife and I um, lived in San Francisco for a dozen years. I got an additional degree from UC Berkeley. And it was in 1997 that um, Janet and I decided to move back to um, the family farm uh, with our young family. Um, we were tired of, of uh, living a rat race for Fortune 500 companies and working as we do really hard. Um, figured if we're going to do that much work, we'll do it for ourselves. And so we came back to the farm and we had a vision of um, what we could create with um, what was at that time just a small fruit stand um, on the side of the road. And um, so today, along with our two adult sons, um, we are, you know, three gener or three seasons of direct marketing every year. And, and we're working year round. Um, 
Stalker Farms has about a dozen full-time employees. And um, at the peak of our season, we, we employ over 200. Um, I, I mailed out just over 300 W-2s this week for last year. Um, I stay busy. Um, I do things like this. I enjoy talking to people and talking about what we do and talking about agriculture. Um, I serve on the Snohomish County's Ag Advisory Board. I'm the chairman of that. I, um, I am on the Snohomish County Farm Bureau. Uh, I help, I work, well, I volunteer in the city of Snohomish on the Economic Development Committee. And I belong to a lot of associations, but specifically to Christmas trees. There's one called the Puget Sound Christmas Tree Association, which is a group of about 50 um, Christmas tree, small family farm, Christmas tree farms in the, uh, in the greater Puget Sound, kind of all around, all around the sound. Um, so our, our tree operation itself um, is about 16 and a half acres, um, all choose and cut. And uh, when I say choose and cut, that is to say that, um, you know, we host the families out on our farm um, to come out and select a tree. We do not wholesale anything. Again, I will not sell anything um, for less than its retail value. Um, we grow five species of tree um, and we sell pre-cut trees as well because not everybody wants to go out and roll around in the mud. So, um, about half our sales are pre-cut, the other half come out of the field. And we're open for about, oh, I think it's about 17 days um, is our Christmas tree season. It goes by really quick. In fact, the U-cuts are, um, are sold out in, in a week. Um, there just isn't enough supply for those. So there's two types of Christmas tree farms, right? Um, there's the wholesale growers, and, and then there's the choose and cut or U-cut farms and and obviously we're we're more inclined to, to the latter um, our little field out in the valley is not conducive to all the species of trees that um, grow better maybe up in the foothills um, you know Christmas tree seedlings are unique to their environment and so when you're um, you're selecting your seed stock you have to keep in mind where you're growing relative to where it is accustomed to growing so um, there's some considerations like that that have to go into it. And so we don't, uh, we're not able to grow everything that the wholesalers do, but, um, but we manage to do just fine. So there's, again, there's two types of tree farm. And then there's, then there's the other one. And I won't, I won't call anyone out, but um, you know, there's uh, actually half of the uh, holiday tree market are um, artificial trees. And so we uh, obviously promote real trees. We find that as farmers, we're, um, we believe in the sustainability of that. Um, and uh, we kind of try to discourage people from having an artificial tree. We'd prefer to find you out on one of our farms to come out and, and take one of our trees out of the field that we can then regrow and, re and replace rather than have it end up in a landfill. So just a little bit about Christmas trees and the economics. And I think that's what I was kind of being asked to, to talk about. I know there was also a, a mark in there about, you know, the environmental benefits of it. And I, I'm not going to be the guy to talk about that. I'm not sure I understand um, all that information or have that all at my, at my disposal. But, um, but I can tell you about what it takes to do a, to do a Christmas tree farm. Um, you know, when, when we're planting trees, we're doing them on about a six by six grid. So that's about 1,200 trees to the acre. Um, and so we're planting bare root seedlings and um, buying these from nurseries, having to order those about two years in advance. Um, I already have my trees purchased, my seedlings purchased for this year. I bought those back in um, 2020 um, and I'm placing my orders now for 2024 um, because those seedlings have to be developed and um, propagated on the on the nursery stock um, to be planted. And when we go to plant those, um, you know, there's attrition. So, you know, part of what, part of the cost of growing trees is the trees you never get to market, whether they um, die during the, the summer weather um, or they just don't develop into a, um, a, a well-shaped uh, marketable tree. Um, so, you know, it's pretty common to see five to 10% attrition on your field. Um, 
or in a year like this, um, this past one, 2021, that um, heat wave we had Memorial Day weekend, um, where especially down in Oregon, they were at 114 degrees out on the tree plantations. They had as much as 90% attrition. Um, so that's going to be um, felt for years to come. Um, it's gonna, you're gonna see the ramifications of that. If you went and bought a Christmas tree this year, you saw that the prices were higher. Um, that was a lot of that was because the supply was impacted. Um, you know, the trees were sunburned. There were uh, anything southern exposure in the plantations um, got got kind of burnt to a crisp. Um, I had trees that I brought in from the wholesale op, uh, wholesale growers, and you know, one side was just scorched, and it's like, oh, I guess that was the southern exposure. So, um, so you know, I'll. I'll talk again in terms of economics a little bit, but it, it costs about $2,500 to establish an acre of Christmas trees. Um, and we'll kind of kind of keep going through the math here, but um, you know, it takes about five to nine years for a tree to reach its market height. And when we say market height, we're talking six to seven, seven to eight feet tall. Um, Douglas fir are the quickest to market. They, they grow quite quickly. They grow twice as fast as a noble or a Nordman fir. Um, and it's that time to market that affects the price. So if you're out shopping for Christmas trees and you, you'll you notice that a, a seven foot Douglas fir is $40, but a seven foot noble fir is um, twice that, you know? And a lot of times people assume that that's because noble firs are more popular. So it's a supply and demand thing. And it really isn't that at all. It's rather, it's how much time it has taken to get that tree to market because it costs about $1,200 per acre per year to maintain a field after you've planted it. Um, and so that difference of um, year five harvesting a Douglas fir versus year nine harvesting a noble fir, you've actually put a lot more money into that crop. Um, and you've experienced more attrition in those additional years. So um, it just, takes a lot more to get those trees to market. Um, and you know, the darn thing about a Christmas tree farm is, you know, you, you don't start seeing money back, right? Again, if you're having to wait nine years to harvest your crop um, and you're putting money into it that whole time, I mean, some of you are probably pretty good with math and you start doing the numbers here and you realize that you're into this thing for $12,000 an acre before you ever got any money back. Um, that's a fairly significant barrier to entry for a lot of people. A lot of people cannot afford to, um, to wait 10 years to see positive cash flow. Um, and so for a person to want to get into Christmas trees, you, you have to be in it for the long haul. Um, we started planting trees in 2002. So if you drive by our properties and see our fields, um, know that that started 20 years ago. Um, that we, you know, we're doing that. And uh, again, it, it takes a while to get it to where it's actually generating cash. Um, so, I mean, the bad news is it takes a long time to get into the market. Um, the good news is it takes a long time to get into the market. So if you can do it and it's what you wanna do, then um, the competition isn't that steep. Um, you know, honestly, there's, there's not enough Christmas tree farms in the area. Um, there's, like I said earlier, about 50 that are um, choosing cut farms around the Puget Sound region. And those are going away. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the growers are um, an older generation. Um, I actually have two farms who I am um, helping to um, phase their fields out of production. Um, uh, older, both widows. Um, and you know they can't keep up with what the um, they started with their spouse, and um, and they have no children that want to take it over. The kids see how hard it is. They recognize that it's you know it's not um, it's not a golden goose. Um, yeah, it's not bad, but it's you know it takes work, and um, boy, it's getting harder and harder to find someone that's willing to do that. So um, so a lot of farmers are aging out. And going away. And what that means is, is, you know, 
the farms that are remaining, you know, we are, like, like I said, we're sold out in five, six, seven days. Um, I have some peers some friends who you can't go to their farm and buy a tree without having been on their mailing list as a previous customer and make an appointment. And then you come out and buy that tree um, before Thanksgiving in November and come back and cut that tree after Thanksgiving. But they, li they literally won't let the public on their property. You have, to be a, you have to be invited to come out because there just isn't that much supply. Um, now, commercial farms for Christmas trees, they tend to be concentrated in the Southwest. So down Rochester, Chehalis, um, Mossy Rock. Um, if you're driving out to um, Ocean Shores, you'll drive through a lot of commercial Christmas tree farms in the Southwest of Washington. Um, down in Oregon, they're, they're scattered from um, south of Portland, Estacada area, all the way down to Salem. Um, and a lot of really big operations down there. You know, we're talking, you know, a couple thousand acres, 2,500 acre tree farms. And again, you, you do the math and, you know, they're, they're generating somewhere in the two and a half million trees per year range. Um, and those trees are being shipped everywhere from Hawaii and Mexico to locally here to they're sent, um, they're sent east as well. And there's a number of Christmas tree farms in the east. Um, so it, you know, it's not unique to the Pacific Northwest, um, but in the Pacific Northwest in Washington and Oregon, they, they say that's about two and a half million trees a year produced. So not an insignificant number. That's about all I had. Um, I figured I'd give you time to ask questions and see what I can do to, you know, speak to the issues that you guys are interested in. Um, Keith, you mentioned uh, that uh, they're getting to be fewer and fewer uh, people going into the business. Is it, is it a question of the hardship of the land or the cost of the land that's getting to be prohibitive? And the uh, lack thereof, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, right. I mean, I keep telling my sons, you know, open, open land is the one resource not being generated. You know, it's going away. And once it's gone, it's gone. We all know that. And so, um, you know, you just, you're not creating more land. Um, we can make a lot of things. We can't make that. And, um, and so, yeah, the cost is going up. Um, you know, I'm going to say the biggest issue is the fact that it's the land is so highly developable. Um, the one the one farm I'm working on, I have been for a number of years now, um, here outside of Snohomish. Um, it's um, two sisters that are both in their 80s. And they're on a 120 acre parcel of timber that um, their parents established a tree farm on and left to them. And um, they don't have the ability to keep it going. So I've been helping them um, to liquidate their, their inventory and kind of transition out them out of it. But you know, I would have been willing to continue to, to plant trees there and, and keep it going. But um, the land is just too valuable as um, for development. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's just not in the cards to continue as a tree farm. Um, and it's been doing, you know, they were growing trees there for 60 years. So um, it's, it's more about the value of the land and the competition for that open land. Then, and that's a big major factor. The other, the other one is, again, it's, it's a long time to get into the market and not everybody wants to do um, the work that it takes and wait that long to get paid. I just stopped the screen share just a section. Uh, yeah, that's fine. And I thought I, I'm going to put you on uh, speaker view here so you can talk to the questions. Um, Kate asks about the transfer of development rights. And um, can that help protect a piece of land like you were suggesting uh, these um, octogenarian ladies <laughs> own with 120 acres? Um, who have had trees on that land for a considerable length of time. Um, 
can something like that benefit them as well as benefit uh, the keeping of the land as agricultural land? Um, you know, that's a great question. TDRs are, um, are a wonderful tool, I think. Um, they haven't yet matured in our area. I, I Maybe they have in other places. I mean, I know that Seattle is just now finally um, getting, or King County is getting things opened up to where TDRs can be moved out of Snohomish County to King County. And I know that they're creating a, um, a banking system to where they can start to make some better use of those TDRs, because a lot of times, I mean, you know, like, let's say myself, um, you know, we have some property that maybe would qualify as, as TDR um, land, but it's like two, you know, I got two TDR rights. Well, most developers who want to acquire TDRs to em enhance density in an urban area, they, they need more than two. And, and so um, coming to uh, individual um, property owner and buying two here and three there and one over here is really tedious. It's not, doesn't make much sense. So the Snohomish County has set up a bank and um, they're actually now able to aggregate TDRs into this county bank and then sell to a developer the 20 TDRs they need out of the bank. And, and I think that is going to become more realistic um, for to create a market environment. Um, that's the, really the problem there is that it's, it's hard to really know what that market environment looks like. And so um, it needs to mature a little bit more, I think, before it really takes off. And, um, you know, we just haven't been able to see it do that yet. Um, it's been around now for a while, right? Um, and we're all kind of waiting to see it turn into something viable, but it, but it hasn't quite taken off yet. You know, you talked a little bit about um, how long it takes for these trees to mature. Uh, and of course, while they're in that process of growing, they are uh, sequestering carbon, which is, you know, part of that whole process. Um, can you give me an idea or give us an idea of how many of those trees you allow to be cut? in any good in order to sustain that you know in, so that you have trees every year how do you go about managing what it is the number the, of trees that that you cut each that's a, time? that's a that's a great question i'm glad you asked it because a lot of times people get mad at us for closing our fields because we don't allow all the trees to be cut that are of of market height um we will grow we'll, we'll harvest about um i don't know 100 120 trees per year per acre so you know maybe 10 percent of them um you know and, and you get to where it's kind of turning over right and so you've you've cut like right now i'll go out and put seedlings in at all the stumps that are in the field right we have a 16 acre field there's trees cut randomly from across it and we'll go out and plant a, next to a stump and so you'll have a uh, a five foot tree and right beside it, you'll have a little baby seedling that um, is gonna be seven years in the making. And so we only will cut about 10% in any given year of the uh, field. And it's in varying stages of growth, but, um, but we have to hang on to some for next year. And so we oftentimes will have people, you know, frustrated with us because we're saying no we're we're done selling out of the field and they'll be looking at it and going but I, I see perfect trees out there and it's like yes you do and that's next year's crop do we have other questions out there you guys i, I know this is something that um uh in order to sustain the tree farms i know you've probably uh gone into other uh agricultural products too keith um, you mentioned blueberries. Um, I know when I was looking up for uh, my garden club, uh, a field trip, one of the things I saw too were, were sunflowers. So uh, do, you, uh, do you find that that kind of, how do you manage that? I mean, is that in the same area as your tree farms? Is it, is it uh, among your blueberries or whatever? How does that work for you? 
We, we, we actually operate two sunflower festivals. Um, we do one at our blueberry farm um, for about five weeks in July and August. Um, and it's uh, an opportunity for people to come out in the summer and experience sunflowers and cut flowers and do that. And at the same time, go pick blueberries. So we call it berries and blooms, right? So it's a little bit of a, you can do one or the other or both. Um, and, and we do things like, um, again, everything we're doing, we're, it's agritourism, right? It's bringing people onto the farm and exposing them to agriculture and with a twist, right? So when I say with a twist, when that, what does that mean in the world of sunflowers? Well, we bring in um, from Massachusetts every week um, butterflies and they come to us in a little wax envelope and they're hibernating they've been they've been shipped to us overnight on ice and we will sell butterflies to families and their children and the children get to release their own butterfly out into the sunflower field and create a memory that they won't get anywhere else and um and so that's unique to what we do um and so you know sunflowers is just something that's evolved um it's a, a trend that we saw coming and we got on board with that uh, we don't know how long that'll go and then it'll be replaced by something else um but it's a way to help supplement um you know the experience that we offer and give people a another reason to come out and, and engage with us on the farm um and so whether that's at the you know, at the blueberry farm or in the fall, we do sunflowers there in September, similar thing. Uh, we can't do butterflies in the fall because it gets too cool. But, um, you know, your, um, your, your grandchildren are in the world of Instagram now. How many of you have a kid that's doing this all the time, taking a selfie and putting it up on their social media page and you know, showing the world what they're up to this weekend, right? Well, our sunflower field caters to that demographic. And um, boy, I see, I see people out there just dressed to the nines, enjoying the field, taking pictures, grabbing the sunset, you know, and, and sharing that with their friends. And um, so we're, it's just kind of the times we're in and we, we cater to those trends. So, um, you know, that's agritour. That's agritourism. You know, uh, it's called agritourism. I, I like that. One. But uh, you, you know, um, there are a couple of other uh, questions. Uh, this group never, you know, disappoints when it comes to asking questions in the chat. Um, one of them, I think, is uh, right, probably right at your heart. Is is uh, and talking about young people. Uh, what kinds of opportunities are there to mem mentor young farmers? Uh, from uh, the organic farm schools on Windy or Young Farmers of America, how does how are you able to connect with those uh, younger generation? So you know we, we see ourselves doing that in a few ways. Um, number one, through farm the Washington Farm Bureau has great um, young farmer and rancher programs um, to where they specifically are made are tailored to. Um, First generation people getting into um, into farming helps them to land softly in that and um, address some of the challenges that they're going to face. Um, you know, like Snohomish County Farm Bureau, we give out seventy five hundred dollars in scholarships to um, to graduating seniors that are going into um, either the trades or an agricultural um, type of curriculum so you know they're going to WSU to, to study ag engineering or they're going to Lake Washington Tech to become a diesel mechanic um, you know we'll issue scholarships to to those young people um, of course FFA is a great program in our high schools um, a lot of um, a lot of kids that want to get exposed to agriculture are doing it through that and and we're supporting that either. Um, I mean, again, I'm talking to, to classrooms. I'm doing things like this um, and talking about what it would it take to, you know, how do you make a living in agriculture? Can it be done anymore? And of course, the answer is yes. And there's lots of ways to do it. The other class that's out there, the other resource that's out there is um, through WSU Extension. And it's, um, what do they call it? They basically have a 12-week um, um, winter class that they put on 
and they meet via Zoom and it's um, business marketing and business plan um, for people that think they want to become farmers. And uh, the goal of that is to let somebody sit down and put pencil to paper and really work the numbers out and think about their their idea, what they think they want to do. Maybe they want to grow flowers or they want to do a CSA or they're going to, um, you know, have, make you know, raise goats and make milk or cheese, right? So it's like that WSU class lets them sit down and listen to industry experts and talk to, you know, banks and insurance agents and guys like me. And we, they hear everything good and bad about the industry. And so WSU's program helps, they do about 40 people per class. Um, and, um, a lot of those people will get through the end of the class and go, you know what? I'm so glad I did this. I've decided I'm not going to be a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you. You've saved me a whole bunch of time, effort, and money, right? Yeah, I invested a few months of my time to figure it out, but better to do, that, do it that way than to dive in, um, invest money, and then come away with, you know, with your hands empty. I always say that the best way to end up as a millionaire farming is to start out with $2 million. So, <laughs> yeah, the, um, there's a, uh, you know, the, the organ, organic farming is huge for most mm -hmm. people these days. Yep. So it's one of the questions, industry. Uh, um, uh, is the use of chemicals and herbicides on the tree farms. Do you, uh, how do you manage that? Are you able to uh, manage without most of the time, or are, is it a must to actually have to use some chemicals? Yeah, you know, you guys probably won't like me. I'm a conventional farmer. Um, I don't, I don't really apologize for that. Um, the organics are a, a growing industry, and they're doing great. Christmas trees, um, you know, if there's a negative, it's when you're doing a monocultured crop like that. Um, and there's that kind of density, um, you know, there's a lot of disease pressure that comes into that. Um, and so, and, and when you're trying to create a product that is, um, um, boy, how do I want to say this? When you go out and buy a Christmas tree, and I'm going to guess many of you do, how particular are you as to what you're buying? And, and the reality is, is most people, and frankly, it's mostly women who are the, the decision maker in that Christmas tree purchase. I believe me, I know, because I sell thousands of trees a year and I watch it happen over and over, you know, mom decides what they're going to take home. And she is usually pretty darn particular. And so if there is, you know, insect pressure that's created a curled needle or there's, um, you know, you haven't used a fungicide to control the rust or the, um, the mildews that form in those trees in that dense planting environment, you know, it, it's not going to be marketable. And so um, I, I, I would say that Christmas trees are very difficult to grow without um, the use of some pesticides. Um, and so, you know, if there's, if there's a knock on, our, on that industry, it's may, it may well be that. Um, can it be done organically? Sure, you can, be, you can do it organically. Can it be done cost effectively organically? Yeah, no, that's where it gets hard. It gets um, to be challenged. Speaking of keeping people encouraged in farming, um, there's another question in here about, um, can, do you think that retiring farmers, would they be, uh, is there incentive to lease to younger people who may not have the credit to borrow? Uh, to get into the business? I, I think there is, yes. Um, and there are programs out there that um, are designed to connect um, retiring farmers with people that want land. Um, those programs exist. Again, they're managed by, um, by WSU. And so it's possible. Um, is, it, is it like overwhelmingly present, prevalent? Mm, no, no, because... Um, most farmers, um, they, they need the value of their land to retire, right? I don't have a 401k, I have land. And um, when the day comes that my wife and I have to retire, 
Um, although I don't know, I think I'll be like my dad. I don't know that I'll ever actually retire. I hope my kids take over and figure out how to support their old man. Um, but, but for a lot of producers, um, you know, the land is their retirement and they've spent all their life buying and gaining equity in it. And of course it's appreciated. And at the end of the day, that's what they have, um, to, to pay for their retirement. And so they, they have to be cashed out. So being able to just hand it over is, is a challenging thing unless they've um, been blessed and are very fortunate to have other resources. Um, it, it, it gets hard. It gets hard. For most of us, you know, farmers are, um, are cash poor and land rich. Keith, one of our objectives uh, in natural resources, especially this year, we're focused on it in, in coming years is to stay the evergreen state, you know, we want to keep the greenery around. We still, we we have visions of young people learning that there can be such a thing as a a, a tree fort, you know, or you know, or an apple war with with uh, you know, or pine cone war going back and forth. And um, we want we want that rather than always being on their tablet. Uh, but one of the things that we've been anxious to restore is more native growth trees, uh, even in the urban areas. And um, are there any tree farms that really focus on uh, creating uh, the natives? In other words, they, they generate more of what uh, is uh, part of Washington. I mean, the Douglas fir, of course, and the, and the pine trees uh, the Christmas tree farms are in part of that, but you know there are other other trees that um, are part of our canopy as well. You know the 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 conversation you haven't asked me about and and I didn't mention, but I will is you know tree farm Christmas tree farms are um, only one part of the timber industry and. There's a lot of um, landowners who have um, small woodlots, is what they call them, and and actually are um, managing their land with um, family-owned forests, and so um, you know they're they're in there um, har harvesting some of their trees that have been there, you know, they're 50 years old, and they're harvesting them for timber. And then replacing them and using their land to generate income that way, and they're called small woodlots, and and those are actually quite prevalent in the area too. And they're not so much urban, but as you get up into the foothills, um, you know, it's you're you're seeing a fair amount of that. And and outside of the urban areas, um, you know, maybe more like up in Skagit County or eastern um, Snohomish County, you'll find those woodlots, and you know. Um, Families like the one I referred to would be a great candidate for that, but um, but those two sisters have eight eight, eight children between them, and um, those kids are probably not going to see eye to eye on how to how to how to settle that estate, and that and that's going to cost that piece of ground. So it would be a perfect candidate for a woodlot. It'd be a, it's a great place for a Christmas tree farm. But again, um, the next generation is, isn't interested in that. So <laughs> we have work to do to <laughs> keep that next generation excited about the trees. Yeah. Um, any, um, can you, are there other questions before? I know you have a, you, you have a full day ahead of you. So um, I, we did record this. I am going to stop recording at some point so that we don't necessarily have all this uh, in the cloud on record, but I do uh, do hope we get a chance to put it up on YouTube so people can hear you um, and that this conversation can continue uh, with others uh, able to, to come into it. Um, is there anything, any other question that uh, you'd like to address to Keith before he, he's off? Is there anything you would like to add before I before you have to depart? Or you can stay for the meeting if you want to, but I've got the Well, I, I, I probably will step away because I, I do have a couple other things I got to get to. But um, 
you know, what I will say is this, is that I, I completely appreciate and understand what it is you want to ac uh, accomplish. And I, I wish you Godspeed in getting there. Um, you know, just like the, the market forces that I have to, to swim against, um, you know, your, your mission is, is facing the same challenge. Um, and it's not that it isn't valid and, and right. It's, it's just that um, we're in a day and age now where the, the pressure to develop is so great um, that, you know, I'm, I'm watching the hillsides right here in the valley. Um, you know, the, the city is marching over and coming down the slopes and, um, you know, Mill Creek is, is at my doorstep. Um, and, you know, the, the good news is, is I'm in a business where all those people now become customers. You know, the bad news is it's creating runoff and um, sedimentation in my stream, you know, in, in my, my, my irrigation ponds and stuff that I'm having to clean out. It's, um, it's creating challenges for me on my water rights. It's, um, you know, not everybody likes having a farmer for a neighbor. We, we tend to make a lot of noise and create a lot of dust and we run our equipment in all hours and it's not quiet. And so, you know, <laughs> we, we, um, we have our, our challenges there, but, you know, it's, it's that growth is just, we have, a, have to find a place to, to create housing for all these people. And that's, it's a challenge, right? I mean, boy, anyone tried to go out and buy a house lately and looked at the <laughs> price of that? It's crazy. Um, you know, these homes that are being built right above my blueberry farm, million dollars a pop. And they're just cookie cutter development. And I just, I shake my head and I, I don't, I don't get it. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the challenge of our, against our land, our open land is it, you know, they, they want to turn it into housing and there's a demand for that. Yeah. So the market versus the, are huge right now and, and will probably continue to be. So uh, if you were, uh, have moved back from California, you understand what that is. And um I, I sometimes tell people I am from San Jose, California, when it was an agricultural community of 20,000. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand quite well what market pressures can do. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. And I, this gave us, uh, I think, a, a fuller picture of some of the, the intricacies involved in just owning and running a Christmas tree farm. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's a lot of fun, honestly. I mean, we enjoy it. Um, you know, we enjoy hosting thousands of families out on the farm every year while they, you know, engage in that holiday um, tradition. And we're, we're thrilled that we're part of that tradition for, for many, many families. Um, and I just recognize there's, there's more opportunity there. I, I, every time I turn around, I'm encouraging someone, you know, I've, I have two friends that have come to me this year and they both were like, I want to be a pumpkin farmer. Tell me how to do it. And I shake my head at him and said, you don't want to be a pumpkin farmer. What you want to be is a Christmas tree farmer. And um, because that's where there's future opportunity um, that, that is being unmet. So, you know, I, I think that's, that's the, that's the message there is if you know somebody that has a, has a chunk of ground, they want to grow Christmas trees. Yep. That's a, that's a way to go just be ready to put money into it for a while before it comes back. Well, thank you very much, Keith. And really, really appreciated you, you coming today and, 